Greetings and salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, Judo Dave Roman, completely refreshed from an eight-day vacation. I think that's the longest vacation I've ever taken in my life. I know some of you people over in the in Australia and in the UK and maybe in Germany are thinking to yourself, eight days? Are you kidding me? We take six weeks. Well, in the no vacation nation, which is known as the United States, if you take more than five days, you're at risk of losing your job. That's kind of how it goes, especially in IT. But that's a risk I was willing to take because it was anniversary weekend for me and my wife. And it was also Judocon weekend, the greatest judo conference in the world. So, yeah, so first things first, my vacation was awesome. I went to Southern California, Los Angeles area. And, and let me tell you, I have not been to Hawaii and I have not been to every single state in the United States. But I got to say, Southern California is the most beautiful place in this country that I have seen to date. And, you know, for all these years, I've said to myself, gosh, why would anybody want to live in Southern California? They pay a, a ton in taxes. The real estate is way too high. The gas price has a double compared to the rest of the nation. I, I just don't get it. Well, after being in Southern California, now I get it. And I would certainly if I had if I could do certain things over again, if I knew what Southern California was like and if circumstances were different for me present day. I would definitely live in Southern California. Now I get it. L.A. is an amazing city. I, I had a lot of people downplay L.A., but I think it's a fantastic city. Um, but I, I got to say, oh, my goodness, the traffic there. Now, now mind you, I've driven in rush hour traffic in, in Boston, New York, uh, Washington, D.C. None of them hold anything to L.A. I just couldn't believe the urban sprawl. And the amount of traffic in L.A., it is it is second to none in, as far as I'm concerned. I've seen reports lately that saying Boston is the worst traffic in the country. Maybe they do. I don't know. But from personal experience, I saw nothing like – I've seen nothing like I saw in L.A. So you got the high pr gas prices. You got high real estate. You got high taxes. You got the, uh, horrible traffic. But still, it's the greatest place on, uh, in this country, in the lower 40, in, in the contiguous United States, I must say. At least in my opinion. I'm sure some of you out there are going to be like, are you kidding me? You should go to San, San Diego or San Francisco. Now, I have been to San Francisco, and I think that is equally as beautiful, just in a different way. But my goodness, Southern California, I, I, I can't say enough about it. I loved it. I, I Now I get it. So I walked the streets of Hollywood. I walked. I did the typical tour stuff. I went on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, which is really funny because you could tell the status of the actors on the Walk of Fame based on where their star is on the sidewalk. I think I saw George Takai's uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame star uh, star in front of a dive bar. I like it was like, ooh, I don't want to keep. I don't want to keep walking down this street. Um, and when I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard, I walked past the. Frozen 2 premiere. I actually walked on a red carpet in Hollywood. It, it doesn't get any better than that, except when I went to Malibu, which was better than that. Malibu is amazing. I went to this place called Point Doom, which is this kind of a hill. Some people, my wife thought it was a mountain. I, I, it's really a hill, but it's, it, it's a hill that overlooks the Pacific Ocean. And I've got pictures on my Instagram. If, if you want to follow me, it's at La Vida Judoka. Uh, my Instagram is awesome. I still got, a, as of this recording, I still got a lot more pictures to put up there. But Malibu is really something else. I can understand why those homes are start at around $8 million, uh, That the, the ones that overlook the ocean. It, it's really something else. I'm almost certain I walked past a few celebrities that live in Malibu, but in, in the place that I was at, you know, celebrities, when they're not all done up with makeup, they just really look like regular people, so... I don't know who I walked by, but I'm sure I walked by a few people, uh, a few Hollywood celebrities that live in Malibu. Wouldn't shock me if I walked right past Jennifer Aniston and didn't even know it. So Thursday was Hollywood. Friday was Malibu. Uh, I went up the Pacific Coast Highway. I started my day over in the, the uh, oh, what's that pier? The Santa Monica Pier, which was beautiful. It's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I maybe spent a couple of hours there. I, I saw it once. I'll probably never go back there again. But it was really nice. It's 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 one of those things that you got to see. Santa Monica is beautiful, uh, and I w went up the Pacific Coast Highway all the way out to Malibu and Point Doom. Walked around, 
And uh, then I made my way to Riverside, California on that Friday, which <laughs> it took me from Malibu to Riverside about three and a half hours. It was bumper to bumper traffic for three and a half hours. I was, well, I wasn't going crazy because I had nowhere, I had nowhere to be in a hurry. So I just took my time and, and uh, made sure I didn't hit anybody. But boy, I, I just, I went to the Universal City Overlook uh, which is on this in this neighborhood in Mulholland Drive. Now, for you video gamers out there, uh, if you've ever played Grand Theft Auto V, yes, I did drive by Franklin's house. I did see it, and I went through that neighborhood. It's pretty cool to see some of the sights in that game in real life, up close and personal. So that was Friday, going going through Mulholland Drive and and Beverly Hills and and all those other nice places all the way out to Santa Monica and then Malibu and then over the Riverside. So a lot of driving. Saturday was JudoCon, the greatest judo conference in the world. So that was really great. I could not make it on Friday. I missed some clinics that I really wanted to be a part of, but spending time with my wife was more important to me. JudoCon was fantastic on the day that I went, which was Saturday. It was hosted by the Riverside Police Department, and they've got their, uh, in a separate building, they've got a really nice mat space. I met some of the listeners out there. I always love meeting the listeners and hearing from the listeners, whether it's in person or, or via email or Facebook messages or whatever the case may be. But meeting listeners, I, that's just a real thrill for me, and I, I'm really thankful for, for, for you guys that came up to me and introduced yourselves. It means a lot to me that you listen to the podcast. So JudoCon started off with me attending a seminar on special needs kids and, and teaching judo to special needs kids. It was really interesting and, and enlightening, and I'm really glad that I got to JudoCon early enough to be a part of that. Um, I received a nice certificate claiming that I, I, I successfully completed that course, which was really appreciated. I, I, I'm very thankful for the people that... Uh, that, that ran that course. Now, now mind you, I, I met a lot of people. I don't remember everybody's names, but uh, there's a few notable people that I did meet, which I was very excited to meet. I met, let's see, the, the, the very talented, the very beautiful, the very athletic Kathy Hubble, who was a Canadian national champion and silver medalist at the Pan American Games back in, uh, gosh, I don't know. She seems... She seems about my age, but I think she might be a little older than me, so I'm not quite sure when she won the Pan Ams. But, and it's my under, also it's my understanding that she's a stunt woman on top of all of her accomplishments in film. Oh, hey, by the way, is it is it politically incorrect for me to call somebody beautiful? I don't know. I, I said that my Yoko Tomonagi looked like Kashiwazaki on drugs, so <laughs> if I can get away with that, I think uh, I think I'm good to go there. So who else did I see there? Dr. Anne Maria DeMars, the very talented, the very opinionated, the very beautiful Dr. Anne Maria DeMars. See, I could call everybody beautiful. And the beautiful Steve Scott. It was great to see him and, and Derek Darling and, and Josh and Madeline and, and Fred Lewis. And gosh, I met so many other people. I can't remember everybody. Oh, yeah. And of course, how could I forget this? Serge Buyasu, the, uh, the head coach of Mayo Quan Chi, judo and wrestling. And look, guys, I got to tell you. Doing this podcast, being a part of JudoCon, I've been very privileged and very blessed to meet a lot of people, uh, many of them I just mentioned. But I, I got to tell you, you know, <laughs> Serge Boyasu inspires me to be a better man. And, and that's if you guys don't know who he is, I, I just I, I feel very fortunate to know him. And I, I, I t he's a real credit to to judo. He's a real credit to the human race. I, that much I can just say I. He had the the the, the closing speech uh, presentation at JudoCon and and it was just um just just listening to Surge was was just uh just really something else. I mean, if you if you any of you out there that don't know him, if you had a chance to spend just ten minutes with him, I think you would understand what I'm talking about. Oh, and and how can I forget the Wall family? The Wall family is tremendous. I mean, what what more can I say about them? They every every year they've been going to JudoCon. I've I've known James. He appeared on the podcast. Uh, Patty and and Caitlin are tremendous. Caitlin uh, le did one of the presentations on mat games for kids, and and they they're just great. And and James, James and 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 Serge are b both of them have among the uh, largest judo clubs in the country. They approach it two different ways. Um, and I respect the hell out of both of them. I, I really do. They just James has a different, a refreshing perspective 
on running judo as a business. And they are just, just the Wall family are just very enthusiastic instructors. And again, they are a credit to, to the judo community. And if you guys don't know them, uh, you're missing out. I, I, re I really mean that. I, I, I think the world of everybody that was at JudoCon. So there were several sessions at JudoCon. There was the, there was the mat game section, session. We actually had a, a, about an hour uh, of, of time was, was, was an actual class of sorts. And, man, I was really horrible. <laughs> you ever have one of those days where you just, like, nothing is going right for you? And that was just me on Saturday. I, I didn't sleep very well. And then when we were doing some of the mat games or something like that, I ended up hurting a kid inadvertently. And I just, I, I just, once I hurt a kid or hurt somebody, my, my day just goes to crap. It really does. And it wasn't really my fault. Like, I, I didn't do anything wrong per se. It's just, I, I didn't actually do anything to hurt her, but she happened to be throwing me. This is like, a, I'm talking about an 11-year-old girl. And, and she happened to be throwing me. She did like this drop throw. And... You know, I you, kids that are that are shorter and 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 weaker and 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 much lighter. I I tip. I will actually jump for throws. I'm not gonna let them, you, you know, use all their strength and and energy to take me over. But so I jumped for the throw a little bit and made sure that I cleared her. But I felt something buckle underneath me as she was throwing me with uh, Sayoya Toshi, and and sure enough, she ended up twisting her ankle. Something like that. I felt it. And I, I felt terrible. I, I just, I, I, it wasn't my fault. But when that happens, I'm usually very skittish for the rest of the day. And I, I just did not represent myself very well in terms of my judo ability and skills. I, I do have skills. I, so I felt like I had to defend myself to people. I'm like, guys, I'm really not this bad. I swear. <laughs> so the classroom session was very interesting. It's, it was one of those rare situations that I was just a student in in a judo class so they were doing drills and stuff that i uh i'm not really quite used to that i was doing this round robin i haven't done round robin in judo in years and i was just just screwing it up i think derek darling was starting to get mad at me or something <laughs> it's like guys it's round robin it's not that hard <laughs> so let's see steve scott and and derek taught uh i learned obito Ob obitori gaishi which is a throw that I've never been formally taught. It's I, I'm glad I was there for that session. They taught it really well. Uh, Derek showed an entry to to get the 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 Georgian grip, and it was slightly different than how I've done it all these years. Maybe it's because I'm used to to grappling with with uh, jujitsu guys with bad stances and such. But but just a little variation and getting that that behind the back uh, grabbing the belt grip, and I I thought it was very useful. So I really appreciate the instruction there. Now, I got to say, my favorite session by far, besides listening to Serge speak, was the kata section. Now, guys, I know it. You guys are about to fast forward through this. Listen to me. Cody, don't press that fast forward button. Christian, I know you pressed, you're about to test for your showdown. Don't. You got to listen to this. This is really good stuff. Now, you too, Bob. Now, I'm sure there's a Bob out there saying, man, is he talking to me? That's right. I am talking to you. Where was I? Oh, yeah, kata. So around the 4 o'clock hour, we broke up into different sections and groups. One group was, I don't even know what everybody else was. There were four groups of people working on different things, different throws. As soon as, uh, let's see, as fellow, fellow, but two fellows by the name of Al and, and Brian, they know who they are because I know they're going to be listening to this. They were holding a session on, on really just a question and answer on Nage no Kata. Now, I, I felt a little guilty because I pretty much dominated the discussion, but it was really helpful to me because there were aspects. Uh, uh, there are things about Nage no Kata that I could really improve on because, as, as you guys know, for, for your longtime listeners, I, I had to teach myself Nage no Kata, and then I had to teach my Uke Nage no Kata on, on how to perform the role as Uke. So there were just some things that I needed actual questions uh, answered, and I got some of those questions answered, and, and I am very grateful for those two gentlemen to take the time to, to, to answer those questions and to clear up some misconceptions and mistakes that I've had on Nage no Kata. Now, the thing is, I've said this before, and I'll say this again, and I'll maintain this. Like When it comes to learning judo throws, um, and, and other techniques, you, you typically over time will make the technique work for you. But Nage no Kata is difficult in the sense that there is no room for personal interpretation in making the throw work for you. 
there is a defined way of doing nage no kata and that's the way you do it and it's either right or it's wrong and i tell you it takes a lot of skill to be able to do that kata both left and right sided the way that it's intended to be done so for me to have these questions answered and such it was it was a tremendous uh uh session for me and i'm very grateful i hope in the future when i go to to judo con next year which from what i hear early rumblings are saying that it's going to be someplace in the east coast i might add that florida is very nice in this time of year i hope that there will be an hour or or some time dedicated to kata because i i think that's important for for us recreational judoka which is most of us and and i i want to point out recreational because you know we are all uh, Really, most of you that listen to this are adults. Many of you have your own clubs. Many of you teach other people. I really don't have my own club per se, but I, I, I mean, I belong to a club, but it's not, I'm not a coach or anything like that. I just help out from time to time when I, when I can make it to the judo classes. But it's re really, these sessions are just geared toward coaching and, and just toward grassroots judo and, and becoming better coaches, better instructors. A uh, better judoka. It, it's just judokan is just tremendous, and I'm sure Steve, you, you Steve Scott is probably going to be listening to this. So Steve, if you want my opinion on judo uh, judokan, A plus across the board. I think you you guys, everybody involved, have done a a, a, a tremendous job, and I think uh, this year was even better than last year. Even though I was only able to go one day, and I thought last year was tremendous. All right, let's see. So is there anything else I need to cover about the trip? Oh yeah, I went to. Uh, to a place called uh, what the heck was it called? Palm Springs. I went up this this aerial tramway that rotated. I I saw the San Andreas Fault. I, I was stunned to see uh, <laughs> houses built on top of that. And then for the following uh, four or five days, I went out to Arizona and visited my father. It was great uh, spending time with him. I don't get to see him as often as I would like, but uh, we went up to the Grand Canyon. We went up to. Uh, this place called Montezuma's Castle. I, I suggest you look it up. It's, it was just tremendous to see uh, in person. And then uh, drove all the way down to Tombstone. I basically saw all of Arizona and um, or, or north and south of Arizona. Anyway, north of Phoenix, five hours north and about four hours south of Phoenix. So I, I saw quite a bit of Arizona. And uh, it was nice in its own way, but uh, not as nice as Southern California, at least in my opinion. Anyway. I am back now, and in light of all the discussion with regards to judo con and grassroots judo and stuff, I I I, uh, I want to get into talking about the subject of discussion here for this episode, and it, it's related to the title that I've named this episode, and this goes all the way back to my very first episode of this podcast, which happened, which took place almost three years ago. I'm almost. Uh, celebrating that anniversary of three years on the podcast which is really still unbelievable to me but so for those of you who have not listened to that episode the discussion of that very first episode of this podcast was the international judo federation's ban on leg grabs yeah 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 i know right right the horrors so if you haven't listened to that episode, I'll just sum it up in this way. It was an episode where I defended the leg grab ban in International Judo Federation competitions. And that, that's competitions in the highest level. And I was, I think at the time, I, I felt that it was fine and it wasn't such a big deal um, to, to ban the leg grabs. Because for me, when it happened didn't really affect my judo one bit. I, I was not a leg grabber. I didn't play in a bent over posture. I was always, I always believed in postured, big throw, epon judo. And, and that just, leg grabs at the time was not something that I ever really trained for very much because it just, it didn't produce the type of high altitude type of throws that I wanted my judo to represent. And I still feel, even even three years later, I think I said this on the episode that if your judo depended on single legs and double legs to work, uh, then in my opinion, you weren't very good. And, and look, that doesn't mean that you didn't have a, an awesome single leg or an awesome double leg. And that certainly doesn't mean that I could defend your single leg or double leg. I'm just talking about an overall skill set. And I'm definitely talking in generalities. I don't mean everyone. 
I'm just saying that if the goal is for your judo and your development is is trying to become the best judoka as possible and to throw with Ippon every single time you attempt a technique, I think that statistically speaking, singles and double legs were really a, a bad way to go about it. But, you know, way back before the, the uh, rules changed, you, you know, you had a lot of... of uh, Especially in the lighter weight divisions, a lot of pickups, a lot of single legs, a lot of double double leg. They they would get a Coca or a Yuko, and and a lot of guys would just kind of ride out that score or try and invoke a winner by Shido and, and that kind of thing. And it just it just was was ugly to watch um, in, in a lot of ways. And I don't you know a lot of people can say well it was effective, but okay, so it was effective at what? Getting a score, a, 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 a cheap score, or, or getting a pawn. And to me, when it comes to judo, the pawn is everything. Whether that's in Nawaza or Tachiwaza. And look, if you're in the middle of typing me an email right now saying, what about Teguruma or what about Kataguruma? Look, just just stop. Because, you know, you you and I both know that when it comes to the complaints on the leg grabs, we're not talking about those throws. We're talking about the, the people that do the most complaining are, are, are the people that that depended on single legs and double legs. And, and you, come on, you know that's the truth. But look, this is, what I'm talking about here is not necessarily a, a, about leg. Well, it, it is and it isn't. So let me let me just go with this. Neil Adams, uh, on his recent podcast, had a lot of interesting things to say about leg grabs and about his trip to un- to the uh, to the United States, and, and it was it was very revealing. And it wasn't just about it's not revealing about necessarily the leg grabs, but for me, I thought it was very revealing on maybe the thought process behind these type of decisions and and the the attitudes, quite frankly, of the. International Judo Federation and people that are closely associated with that and the rest of the judo world. So I highly recommend that you you listen to that episode. Um, I won't go as far as is saying listen to that episode first before you listen to this one, but I think it may be a good idea to listen to Neil's own words on on sport judo and, and the IJF and, and really – you know, he didn't say it directly, but but how he feels about really everybody else that kind of is left out in the cold. So let, let me let me put it this way. I mean, well, well, first let me let me get this out of the way. So Neil and, and his wife Nikki, uh, they discussed, they talked about their trip on to the United States to the West Coast. They they went out to Portland Judo. I think they went out to a couple other places in California. They went out to Hawaii, and then I think they jumped on a cruise. I, I follow them on Instagram, so. So I'm not a stalker or anything. I just kind of know what they did over those three weeks when they were not home. And, you know, the immediate impression that I got when he was talking about his trip is that a lot of people asked him in the United States about leg grabs and the leg grab ban. And I, and I got to say, you know, if you're sharing the mat with with a master like Neil Adams and the leg grab question is the best you can do, I mean— that's pretty absurd. I mean, Neil Adams to me is a judo master. And and you're going to ask that guy about leg grabs. Of all the things that you could possibly ask when you share the mat with a master, you you care about leg grabs, really? I mean, that's that's pretty sad, I I must say. So whoever you are, if you're listening or not, come on. But the thing is is that a lot of people did apparently ask him about leg grabs and you know, he essentially said on his podcast, which is something that I I've, I've speculated for years but given that neil is so closely tied with the with the international judo federation he's kind of confirmed what i've really felt all along and 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 folks they're not coming back at the highest level of competition and and you're just gonna have to learn to accept that reality and that and accept that truth this is when it comes to the international judo federation what you see on the world tour that is the judo that they want to uh spread across the world now, I, I want to be perfectly clear. I I don't think that's a good thing. I think, okay, so I think when it comes to the highest level of competition, when it comes to viewership and, and creating exciting matches, 
Um, I think the rule set that they have in place is fantastic for the most part. I, I, I still would like to see a higher level of scoring for both Wazari and Ipon. But I do think they create exciting matches uh, for the most part. Not, not every match is exciting. I mean, it's, you know, in, in a big grand slam, there's tons of, 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 of matches happening. I can't possibly watch every single one. But, but there's a lot of drama. There's a lot of excitement with these matches. And they've got a sport that they put on TV that's, that I think is exciting to watch. And, I, and I, I've said it a couple times before over the past year or two that, you know, come next year at the Olympics, I think a lot of casual observers who tune in just watching judo for the Olympics, they're, they're going to be pleasantly surprised uh, with what they're seeing. They, I think they're going to like a lot of the changes. Now, all of that being said, what I thought was most disappointing with many of Neil's comments and, and Nikki's comments, you know, his wife, she was also a very high-level competitor, is that from their point of view, judo is only a sport. Judo is not a physical education system. Judo is not a budo. It, judo is not a means of self-defense. Judo is just a sport. And, and I think... I felt that in the episode, he made that very loud and very clear that that is the perspective of the International Judo Federation uh, when it comes to judo. And if judo is only a sport, then all you've got are athletes and coaches. And that's it. If you don't, if you don't fall into the category of athlete or coach, then you're, you, you don't really matter. I, I mean, at least that's their perspective. And, and, and the, you know, the IJF may not say that outright or Neil may not say that outright. But really, if judo is just a sport, then kata doesn't matter. Then leg grabs don't matter. And really, any adult that is not feeding into the system of competition doesn't really matter. So, so guys like me, I, I don't matter in, in terms of judo from, from the IJF's perspective. Now I do I do think there's a lot of people out there that that complain about the leg grab ban and stuff because it did directly impact their, their judo. But we must acknowledge that there are many people out there that complain about the leg grab ban because it is changing how the entire judo curriculum is being taught at all levels. Now look, I do understand why that that leg grab ban change was made and it was it was because of pressure from the International Olympic Committee. I, I completely understand that and in that regard, uh, the the IGF made the correct decision. They they absolutely had to change, but I firmly believe that had judo gotten rid of the Coca and the Yuko, things would have been fine. I I really I really believe that because Single legs and double legs simply didn't score Epon or Wazari very often. They they didn't, you know, back then, back in the day, it's a very low percentage uh, technique f for getting those scores. And I, I think they could have handled the problem masterfully if they just eliminated the Coca and the Yuko, which they ended up doing anyway. So Neil on the episode talked a lot about technical development at the lower levels. But you know what? When it... Again, it, this is just a sport point of view, and technical development is does does not include learning learning the entire judo curriculum, learning all the kata. Technical development from the IJS point of view is sport and making sure that you do upright judo, and making sure that the judo that you do is the kind of judo that they want to see. And, and here's the other thing: it's that. You know, when they, call, when they talk about technical development, you, the average listener of this podcast is an adult. So I'm speaking to you directly. Your technical development does not matter, at least in, in the, the eyes of the IJF. And if all of the judo organizations around the world follow what the IJF does, well, then on a national perspective, the technical development is going to follow IJF rules. Now, now here's – and look. This entire segment of this podcast is, is not a means to debate Neil Adams per se because he's not on here to defend himself. And, and in the nature of podcasting, you know, you, you talk behind a microphone, you, you save it, you edit it. And then, you know, sometimes – and I've done this plenty of times, probably at least uh, 
67, 68 times or something like that. I listen back to an episode that I release and everybody else has downloaded and stuff. And I think to myself, gosh, I, I wish I didn't say that in that kind of way. So I fully understand that Neil's point of views just captured an opinion at a particular period of time when a microphone was recording his voice. And now it's it's cemented in for all eternity. So Neil was making this argument that a big reason why the leg grab ban happened, apart from the IOC, was that all of these Eastern Bloc countries came into the judo scene and just had a lot of bent over judo and, and things like that. But this is what I don't really understand from that perspective, is that it's not like the Eastern Bloc countries were a new thing in the 2000s. They have been competing in, in, the, in the Olympics for judo for a very long time. Now, perhaps not as many countries, but certainly, you know, the old Soviet countries, you know, in those regions when it used to be the, the Soviet Union, they, they competed in the Olympics, well, except in uh, 1984. But I did a, I did a quick look at, um, at, you know, for example, some of the countries that competed at the 1980 Olympics. And you had, uh, you had representation from the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, you know, Romania. Uh, let's see, what else? Like Czechoslovakia. I mean, I mean, yeah, those were not all, you know, those are not Soviet Union countries, but they certainly belong to the Eastern Bloc. So I, I'm not sure what Neil was trying to say when it came to, Eastern Bloc influence making its way into judo because those countries had been competing in judo for a very long time. Um, now, maybe something significant changed in terms of approach and in terms of mindset when it came to competition because, I I mean, I, I know for a fact, well, maybe not for a fact, but I know that for many of those countries in the Eastern Bloc, how you win at judo may have been irrelevant just as long as you won. So racking up kokas and yukos could have been a very viable strategy for those countries. And maybe maybe in the 2000s, things just really, you, you know, not with just those Eastern Bloc countries, but with, with so many other countries, maybe it just got to a point where the Ipon just didn't matter. It was just about getting scores, you know, get the coca, get the coca, you know, get the yuko, whatever the case may be. You know, edge play, all of this kind of stuff is like, I really think it watered down what we were seeing on TV. And and for whatever reason, you know, they, they felt grabbing the legs was the biggest culprit. And I, I just I really believe that all of those countries w with such a strong wrestling influence, they would have adapted if you just changed the rules, um, eliminating the coca and the yuko. So, you know, when it comes to those countries, again... I've seen old video of judo matches and stuff and and some of the representation from the Soviet athletes way back in the day and stuff. Of course, you know, it's stuff that I've seen on YouTube. And of course, I know it could be all highlights and whatever the case may be. But I did see upright judo. And if there's one thing I do agree with Neil on is that is that rules dictate technical development. So I Again, I, I just don't know why they didn't eliminate the coca and the yuko, and it just would have sorted itself out. So here's ultimately where I'm going with all this. I know it's been very long-winded, but my point is this. If you believe judo is only a sport, then that's fine. Whatever the case may be, feel, feel free to continue to, to allow judo to just be a sport for you. But for those of you that really care about overall technical development, and that's including leg grabs, keep fighting the good fight. And I say this because it, it seemed like on that episode, Neil kind of thought it was silly for clubs to be out there to, to, that keep, allow leg grabs. And, and Nikki's point of view was like, well, if you love the sport, you'll, you should change. And, and again, there it is. There it is. It's, it it just comes down to an identity crisis or or what you believe judo is and it's just so disappointing when i see such titans of judo you know and, and i'm not just talking about neil i'm talking about so many other people 
um, th that are in the IJF that grew up with tr what one would consider traditional judo values and, and ideals for development. And, and they are, are those are the people that are changing uh, the, the rule sets of judo. It's not it's not these new, you know, the new blood coming in and just doing, you know, what they think is right because grandpa had it wrong the entire time. It's not it's not like that at all. It's it's the the older generation of people that are in charge of of how you want to frame technical development. They're the ones making the changes for these for these rules. And, and look, I got to acknowledge it's probably good for business. But when it comes to overall judo development, in, in, including everything, it's it's probably not so good. And on top of all that, I, I just don't agree with it. Uh, I'm just a recreational uh, know nothing or do nothing or accomplish nothing guy sitting behind a microphone that just happens to love doing judo. And that's who I am. And. That's who I'll always be, and and I'm okay with that, and you know, and I'm okay in practice at my club if if guys want to grab the legs, you know, or do take Garuma if I if I uh, if I attack them with Osotogari for the five hundredth time, you know, and and throw me on my back. I'm, I I say go for it, do good judo, and and good judo is not limited by, uh, by rule sets. Now, now that's of course. You know, I'm not talking about throws like Connie Basami. That that can be good judo th too, but you know, there's an injury factor involved. But 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 a lot of the key techniques, you guys know that the key techniques that were directly impacted by this change is is uh, it's not a safety issue. So ultimately, what am I saying after about 19 minutes of just flapping my gums on this? I my feeling is both sides of this debate. Are, are correct and, and they're correct for different reasons and right now you got a whole generation of kids and and, and teens that have done judo with without leg grabs and they they don't know any different and you have a lot of people out there with that, that have been doing judo for for 10 20 30 years or more and and they remember a judo when they were leg grabs and it's not about Morote Gari it's just it's just about being having the freedom to be able to do good judo in a, in a safe manner and then you've got the sports side that's just looking to try and and put the best product out there as possible so it's ultimately a clash of ideals now, now i've said it before and i i do maintain that i think a lot of people that a, a lot not all but but a lot that vocally complain about not being able to grab the legs uh they are people that that just don't really have very good judo and, and they think that grabbing the legs is going to be the silver bullet to cure their uh, judo woes. But but I, I think many more people out there, the greater issue is technical judo and traditional judo. And under today's current rules, you, you cannot teach the gokyo uh, without teaching traditional katagaruma and without teaching traditional sukuinagi. And those two throws involve grabbing the legs. But then again, on the flip side, you you can make the argument that Daki Age is no longer allowed in competition, but that is also a throw that is in the judo syllabus, part of what is called the Shin Mesho no Waza, or newly accepted techniques. And even Kani Basami is part of that list. So I don't know. You just 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 do what you want in your clubs, honestly. And if you don't if you don't agree with what the IJF does, then support your Judo organizations that allow for those techniques in their competitions in the United States, it's it's the AAU and and in the UK you have the organization Judo for All UK ran by Samson Samson, which by the way, boy, he is is he fantastic or what? I mean that that guy, he's an excellent instructor. All right, so I think it's going to, that's going to be it for me on on this subject, and, and quite frankly, I think I'm going to. I mean, unless I get an email with somebody asking me questions uh, uh, about this or, or some kind of new discussion or anything, I'm probably going to retire the leg grab discussion as well on this podcast. I, I mean, what what more can be said? Leg grabs for or leg grabs against doesn't matter to me because it doesn't in impact my judo one bit. It doesn't impact my development. Um. I think they should be a part of competitions at, at at a national level, maybe not senior national championships, but at a national level and below. I think leg grab should be part of the curriculum. But you you know, 
Either way, it doesn't impact my judo very much. I, I, in my own club, I rarely grab the leg. I certainly don't do it for Morote Gari or, or uh, you know, Kuchigi Taiyoshi or whatever. I, I don't, I don't do it. I, the only time that I've, I've ever really grabbed the leg when doing judo in a gi is if I'm doing Ouchigari and I, I just, I just tap the knee uh, with my hands. You know, just, just finish that throw off because. It's just right there. That that's probably the only time I ever even touch the legs when I'm doing traditional judo. And what I mean by traditional judo, I mean in a gi. In in no gi, even in no gi, I don't really go for the legs very often, simply because I'm 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 older and and it's not an efficient technique for me. I just if I'm far away, I can't cover the speed to 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 get a double leg. And if I'm up close, well, if I'm up close and tied up, I'm not going to drop down to a knee. Or, or or and shoot a double. I, it do, it doesn't make sense to me. For me, if I'm, I'm if I'm up close, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you in. And I'm gonna throw you big, or at least try to. So, yeah, I, I think from here on out, I'm I'm done with this debate too. So, you know, Neil, I know how you feel. You seem like an outstanding person. I'd love to meet you one day. We may slightly disagree on this issue, but I just think overall you do a fantastic job and keep up the great work. If you listen to this, which you probably won't. Oh, yeah, one more thing, I, 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 and this will be the last thing, I promise. You know, I happen to have audio of Neil Adams responding to a question about leg grabs in the IJF. Come on, get out of here! Now, who would have thought that Neil Adams, when he gets angry, he loses his British accent and sounds a lot like Vince McMahon? Hey, go figure. All right, anyway. All right, so so let's see. Is there any Judah-related stuff I else that I get? Oh, yeah, I, there is something. I got news, or I should say that I read this on judoinside.com, which I've said it before. I'll say it again. If you're not reading judoinside.com, what the hell's the matter with you? Saeed Molai of Iran, who is now a refugee, has been of uh, has been granted refugee status in Germany. Now, for those of you do, who may not remember, I talked about Saeed Molai at the World Championships. He was being threatened by the government uh, for the risk of competing against Sagi Muki of Israel which I think is, is absurd by the Iranian government, but I would expect nothing less. Now, according to the judoinside.com article, uh, Saeed Molai received his refugee status in record time, and it also states that the administrative procedures are not completed yet, uh, and Saeed Molai's journey will remain long until Tokyo 2020. He must now obtain the papers to travel and take part in competitions on the World Judo Tour to continue to collect valuable points at the world ranking list. Now, this is something that I'm, I, I've am i been curious about. I can't seem to find an answer, but I admittedly, I haven't looked very hard. I don't know if his points have been reset. So I, by points, I'm talking about his Olympic qualification points. I know, I at least it was my understanding that when somebody is a refugee or, or their nation switched, that they lose all the points that they acquired from the previous nation. I don't know if they're going to make an exception in this case, but I would have to believe that if Molai competes in all tournaments uh, heading into the Olympics, that he should be able to acquire enough points uh, to, to make it to the Olympics. I, I, I just don't know the answer to that. I wish I did. Uh, at, the, at the time of this recording, there's 251 de days to the Olympics. And the Grand Slam Osaka will be taking place on November 21st. Now, taking a quick peek at the 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 event uh, the, the the event page on the IGF website, it does show that Saeed Molai is supposed to compete uh, in this uh, in this tournament. But again, I don't know uh, with his refugee status if if he's going to be able to make this tournament. I certainly I certainly hope so. And it looks like he's registered uh, for the Osaka Grand Slam to, to uh, representing the IJF uh, refugee team. And unfortunately, Israel will not be sending their full team. The only uh, representative from Israel will be Gili Cohen. So there will be no potential for a Saeed Molai Sagi Muki matchup, which, of course, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing at some point in the future. That will happen. I have to believe that will happen at some point. Hopefully it'll happen before the Olympics, but we shall see. And for those who may be interested, it looks like Team USA is sending 10 athletes to the Osaka Grand Slam. All right. I think that'll wrap up another hideous episode on this podcast. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, 
Feel free to email me at judochopsuishow at gmail.com. If you didn't like the episode, feel free to email me at judochopsuishow at gmail.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, you could do so at La Vida Judoka, which is also my Twitter handle. Um, I talk a lot of Buccaneers football on my Twitter handle. I probably should have a separate uh, personal Twitter handle for my complaints about Buccaneer football. But uh, I use it all the same, so um, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. You can follow me on Facebook, at La Vida Judoka. No, I'm sorry. What the hell am I talking about? <laughs> it's not at La Vida Judoka. You can, follow, you can find the show, Judo Chop Suey Show, on Facebook. You could also find me, Dave Roman, on, on Facebook as well. It just, uh, just like I always ask, if you want to be my Facebook friend, just shoot me a message. Let me know that you're a listener of the podcast, and I'll add you. Otherwise, you'll just end up in friend request purgatory. Let's see. Do I got anything else? Uh, no, I don't think so. So with that, I hope you all have a great day. I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Train hard. Stay safe out there. And until next time, I'm out. Open Gangnam Style.